Who was Babe Ruth? Who was Babe Ruth? Who was Babe Ruth? He was the king of baseball in the 1920s and the 30s. In fact, he broke almost every batting record in the game. But hitting home runs, lots of home runs, made him famous around the world. His real name was George Harmon Ruth. His family called him Little George. His fans had other names for him. The Sultan of Swat, the Big Bum, but his most famous nickname, the one that struck, was Babe. The way Babe hit the ball was different and exciting. He swung with all his might and undercut it, popping the ball high and long. Fans crowded into ballparks wherever he went, hoping to see him hit another home run. He tried not to disappoint them. Babe did everything in a big way. He took crazy chances stealing bases. He argued with the umpires. He was loud and always said what he thought. Sometimes that got him into trouble and into the newspapers. He didn't look like a superstar athlete. He had skinny legs, small feet, and was often overweight. And he didn't take good care of his health. He ate too much and liked to party. He bought fancy cars and drove too fast. He had amazing energy. <clears throat> He stayed up late, sometimes all the night. Then he would play ball the next day. Somehow, he'd still hit homers, but sometimes he was just too tired. Babe's teammates said he would give you the shot off his back. That means he was really generous. He was also great to fans, especially kids. He signed more autographs than just about any player in history. He loved baseball, and the fans loved him. There, had been, there have been other great baseball players before and after him, but Babe Ruth was one of a kind. Chapter 1 Running Wild Babe Ruth was a wild little boy, always in trouble. There were many boys like him in his rough Baltimore, Maryland neighborhood, and they all loved baseball. It was the most popular sport in America in those days. He was born on February 6, 1895. His real name was the same as his father's, George Harmon Ruth. His family was poor same as everyone else they knew. They lived in a noisy, dirty part of town. It was called Pig Town because pigs were brought in on trains and then headed, herded through the streets to the slaughterhouse. His father, Big George, owned a bar. His mother, Kate, took care of the family. Babe was the oldest of eight children. They all lived in a small apartment above the bar. Poor families couldn't afford good food or good care when they were sick. Many children died young. Only Babe and his little sister, Mummy, lived to adult food. By age six, Babe was always on the lookout for something exciting to do. He hated school, so he wouldn't go. Instead, he played in the busy cobblestone streets with his friends. In Big Town, there was lots of mischief for a boy to get into. He and his pals stole apples from fruit stands. They played baseball in the middle of the streets or 
in vacant lots. Wagon drivers smacked their legs with wipes, whips and yelled at them to get out of the road. The boys fired rotten eggs back. The boys called the policemen coppers since their badges were made of copper. Coppers were baby's enemies because they were always trying to make him behave and go to school. Baltimore was a major seaport. Ships came and went, sailing off into the Atlantic Ocean. Dock workers and sailors hung out on the streets. These were rowdy men who cost. Babe learned to cast for them from them. When he should have been le- learning to read and write, he was chewing tobacco and smoking. He even snitched snitched the drinks of whiskey now and then from his father's bar. He wasn't really a bad boy. He had a good heart and was generous right from the start. But he didn't think things through. Once he stole a dollar from his dad to buy ice cream for all of his friends. Big George spanked him just to prove he hadn't learned a lesson. Babe did it again. He talked back to his parents and wouldn't do anything they said. They couldn't keep him out of trouble. One day, they stopped trying. When Babe was seven years old, his father took him for a ride in a trolley car. Did Babe know where they were going? Maybe not. Big George took him to St. Mary's Industrial School for Boys and left him there. It was a reform school, a place for troubles, troublemakers, runaways, and orphans. There were plenty of schools like this, 29 in Baltimore alone. St. Mary's was his new home. His family had given him away. This sounds sad, but it turned out to be the best thing for Babe. At school, he would meet someone who would turn his life around, and he would get loads of practice playing baseball. During his first day at St. Mary's, Babe cried. He was scared and angry. Everything was different from home. St. Mary's was a Catholic school. Babe and the other boys slept in big rooms called dormitories with their beds set in long, neat rows. Babe was used to doing what he wanted all day. School seemed like a prison. There was even a locked iron gate at the entrance. A night watchman kept an eye on the boys to be sure they didn't sneak off. Every morning, the teachers walked the boys at 6.30. Breakfast was usually oatmeal. For lunch and supper, they ate soup and bread. There wasn't much for growing boys. Sundays meant special meals, hot dogs and bologna. Classes took up most of the day. Babe learned to read, write, and do math. All the boys trained to become bakers or tailors. After lessons, they all played outside in the cement slab yard. About 800 boys lived at the school, and most of them liked baseball. With so many kids around, it was always easy to get the game going. Sometimes, one particular teacher would put on a show for the students with his bat and ball. He was a big, strong guy, about six and a half feet tall. He tossed up one ball after another and take a hard swing at each other. He'd wall up them high and long across the school yard. <clears throat> this man was brother Math- Matthias. He was a good guy and watched over the toughest boys at the school. No one else had ever paid much attention to Babe, but Brother Matthias did. 
He tried to help him became, become a good person. Brother Matthias was calm and firm, but fair with the students. They respected and liked him. When he was around, they behaved. Matthias started a league with about 40 teams made up of the best players at the school. Bay was so good that when he was 8 years old, he played with the 12 years olds. Matthias let the boys try playing different positions. Bay might have fielded it one day, played catcher another, and warmed the bench the next. This was good training. Babe was an excellent catcher. He was a southpaw, which means he was left-handed. The school only had mitts for right-handed players, so he would catch the ball in his gloves left hand. Then he'd toss the ball up quickly, snap, shake up the glove, catch the ball in his bare left hand, and throw it to the bases. One day, Babe was catching at home plate. He began making fun of the pitcher. Brother Matthias wanted to teach Babe a lesson, so he told him to try pitching and see if he could do better. Babe hadn't pitched before. Even though he worried he might embarrass himself, he did as he was told. When he got on the pitcher's mound, Babe felt at home right away. He wound up and threw the ball. Turns out he was a natural. From then, on, from then on, he most played pitcher. If not for Matthias and the other teachers, there's no telling what might have become of him. Matthias was like a father. Babe later called him the greatest man he'd ever known. When Babe became a famous baseball player, everyone loved him. But when he was a schoolboy, it seemed that only brother Matthias did. Other boys' families visited them at the school. Baby's parents didn't, even though St. Mary's was only four miles from Baltimore. This made him sad. When he was 15, his mother died. A few times over the years, Baby went to live at home for a while. It never worked out, and he always wound up back at the school. After 12 years at St. Mary's, he would get his big break and leave for good. Chapter 3. The Baltimore Orioles The baseball coach at St. Mary's was outgoing and friendly. One of his friends was Jack Don, the owner of the Baltimore Orioles. At that time, the Orioles were a minor League team, it was the year 1914. By now, Babe was 19 and 6 and 2. He was a star pitcher on the school team after watching him pitch in a workout. Dunn offered him $600 a year to play for the Orioles. Babe was thrilled and surprised. He didn't realize that pro baseballers got paid. He thought they just played for the fun of it. At St. Mary's, he'd trained to become a trailer. Tailors didn't own anywhere near $600. He signed Don's contract. It was his lucky day. Along with the rest of the Orioles team, Babe took the train to Fire Fayetteville, North Carolina, for spring training. He'd never been outside Baltimore before. Everything was new to him, including trains. One of the other players showed him how to unfold his bed from the wall. There was a small net pouch hanging on the wall just above his mattress. His teammate told him to rest his pitching arm in the pouch while he was sleeping, so Babe did. The next morning, his arm was stiff. The other players laughed like crazy. The pouch 
was really for st storing clothes. It had been a practical joke. Around this time, he got his famous nickname. His teammates couldn't help grin grinning over how little he knew about the world. Someone called him Jack, him Jake Doon's new babe. Everywhere a babe looked, there was something fun to try. He'd never seen an elevator before. He rode the one in the hotel up and down, up and down. He was used to getting up early because of St. Mary's. Before the other players walk, he would go watch the trains come and go at the station. When he rode a bike for the first time, he was as excited as a little kid. But nothing made Babe happier than the food in the hotel restaurant. He couldn't believe that he could eat whatever he wanted, and the Orioles would pay. At his first breakfast, he gobbled down three stacks of pancakes while his teammates watched in amazement. They were even more amazed when they saw what he did at bat. On March 7, he won Lope, a fantastic homer, his very first as a pro player. It streaked over the right fielder's head and didn't stop until it rolled into a cornfield. Back then, no one kept the distance records, but fans measured it at 600 feet. That was the longest slam ever in the back. Soon, the Orioles were back in Baltimore for the start of the season. Babe got his first paycheck, $100. It seemed like a fortune. Right away, he bought a motorcycle and zoomed to St. Mary's to take his old school friends for a ride. It must have felt great to show them all how well he was doing. Jack Toon worried he might crash his new toy and tried to make Babe get rid of it. But he wouldn't. On April 22nd, Babe pitched his first regular season game. The Orioles won in a 6-0 shutout against the Buffalo. He kept pitching that season, winning some and losing some. Nobody had any idea how famous he would soon become, not even Babe. Still, he was full of confidence. In June, the Orioles won 13 games in a row. Hardly anyone noticed at one Orioles games. There were only 17 fans. Right across the street from their ballpark was a new stadium. It was the home of a major league team called the Terrapins. Baltimore fans went to see those games instead. Babe was one of the best minor league rookies. The world for young players just starting out. Jack Dunn worried that Terrapins might steal Babe away, so he tripled his salary to 1800 US But without ticket sales, the Orioles were losing money. Dunn had to sell off some players. The Boston Red Sox wanted Babe. A deal was struck. After only six months, Babe had hit the big time, the major leagues. Chapter 4 The Red Sox Babe headed for Fenway Park in Boston, home of the Red Sox. Although they'd been world champions in 1912, they were now in sixth place in the American League. He joined the team on July 11. 1914. His first game was against the Naps, a team soon to become the Cleveland Indians. Right away, the Red Sox manager wanted to see what the baby could do. He told him to take the mound and pitch. Most rookies would have been nervous. After all, this was his first major league game. But Babe kept his cool. The Red Sox won 4-3.
Baby's teammates expected him to be in awe of them. Instead, he treated everyone as his equal. He was always joking around. Other players didn't know what to think about him at first. No one knew what a great player he would become. In fact, another pitcher on his team was performing better than he was. So, in August, the Red Sox owner sent Babe to pitch for a minor league team he owned in Rhode Island called the Province Grace. Babe missed the Red Sox. He also missed a woman he'd met named Helen Woodford. She was a waitress at the Boston Cafe shop where Babe often had breakfast. After the season ended, Babe married Helen on October 17, 1914. He was 19 years old and she was only 17 for a while. They lived in an apartment in Baltimore and were very happy. But Helen was shy and had no idea what she was in for. Being the wife of a pro baseball player like Babe would not be easy. Babe began the 1915 season playing with the Red Sox again. During his time with the Grays, he'd gotten rid of a bad habit. Without realizing it, he'd always called his tongue before first throwing a curve ball. It was a dead giveaway to batters. Everyone could see the improvement in Babe's pitching than in a game against the Yankees. Something historic had happened. It was May 6, 1915, and he was up at bat. Another young player might have bunted or hit grounder, playing it safe. But Babe swung at the pitch with as much power as he could. Crack! The second echoed through the back. The ball flew and flew. Wow! As it shot up higher and farther, the crowd burst with excitement. Eventually, it landed high in the grandstand seats. It was his first home run in the majors. Fans took notice. Who was this new guy? In those days, hardly anyone hit the ball super hard. Homers were rare. A power hitter might hit 10 in a whole season. The Red Sox won the American League pennant that season. They would play the Philadelphia Phillies in the World Series. Babe could hardly wait to pitch in his first World Series. He loved the competition, but except for one pitch hit, he wound up warming the bench. Though the Red Sox won, Babe was disappointed he hadn't played more. With some of his earnings. He bought a new bar for his father. Suddenly, two years later, Big George died in a street fight. Except for his sister, Mommy, no one in his family lived to see Babe become famous. In 1916, the Red Sox made it to the World Series again, this time against the Brooklyn Robins, which later became the Brooklyn Dodgers and is now the Los Angeles Dodgers. Babe pitched in the game two, which stretched into a whopping 14 innings. The Sox won the series again, and this time Babe played a key part in the championship. The Red Sox missed out on the league pennant and the series in 1917, but Babe had pitched 24 winning games during the season a career high so far. Millions of Americans were going to Europe to fight in World War I. The world was changing around Babe, but he didn't pay much attention. His life was baseball. Chapter 5 Slugger In 1918, pitchers ruled the game. Batters rarely hit homers. 
they were happy to even make it to first ba base. Scoring meant being first around the bases or quick at stealing them. Because of this, final game scores stayed low, sometimes only a few runs. Babe was a game changer. He wanted, he wanted to win by making power hits. However, too much pitching and batting could injure a pitcher's arm. Babe wanted to stop pitching and start hitting, but the Sox manager said no. With the baby on the pitcher's mound, the Red Sox made it to the World Series again. This time they were playing against the Chicago Cubs. After Game 3 of the series, Babe was hosting around with his teammates. He accidentally punched his left hand, his throwing hand, into a wall. He was supposed to pitch the next day. Babe had really messed up this time. When he stood on the pitcher's mound in game four, his middle finger was badly swallowed. It hard to grip the ball. Amazingly, he still led the Red Sack to the championship, and the Cubs didn't get a hit off of him until the eighth inning. This meant he pitched 2966 scoreless innings in a row in the World Series. This was a record that stood for 42 years. He also hit 11 home runs that year, a big number in those days. Babe knew he was something special. He began with the Red Sox at a salary of $3,500. Now he was up to $7,000. That was a great deal of money in 1918. Still, Babe thought he was worth more. He refused to play the following year unless he got a raise. The Red Sox agreed to pay him up one of the highest salaries in baseball. $10,000 a year. Back then, that was enough to buy two or three houses. Even more than money, Babe wanted the Red Sox to take him up the mound. To make that happen, he had to prove he was more valuable as a hitter than a pitcher. At the bat in his first exhibition game in 1919, he did. The New York Giants Pitcher threw and the babe swung. Wow! He blasted it over the fence. Then he rounded the bases, reaching home plate in triumph. There are no official records, but some fans reported that the ball had sailed on astounding 600 feet. Things were looking up still. Babe couldn't seem to stay out of trouble. While on tour, the team manager knocked on Baby's hotel room door. It was early in the morning. After a minute, Baby called to him to come in. The manager went over to Baby's bed and yanked the covers down. Just as he suspended, sus su suspected, Baby was dressed in his street clothes. He had been out partying all the night. He had just returned to return to his room at the sound of the knocks. Now, Babe had jumped into bed and pretended to be asleep. The manager scolded the Babe, telling him he needed to change his ways. No one could stay out all the night and play ball the next day, not even a man with Babe's energy. Over the next few months, Babe behaved himself. He even started leaving notes for the manager reporting what time he came home. Unfortunately, he also went into a batting slump. His record was among the worst in the league. The manager asked him to return to pitching. Babe didn't want to pitch again, but he did. Then, just as a, suddenly, he began pitching, hitting home, run, home runs again. On May 20, he hit the first grand slam of his pro career. A grand slam means he hit a homer with the bases loaded, so four runs were scored.
Although the Red Sox didn't make it to the World Series, he set a major league record with 29 home runs. The National League leader hit only 12. Everyone figured Babe Ruth had a great future with the Red Sox. They were wrong. Chapter 6 New the Yankees In early 1920, the Red Sox sold Babe Ruth to the New York Yankees. The news stunned Boston. Many fans today still think it was one of the worst decisions in baseball history. Babe went on to soar with the Yankees, but the Red Sox didn't win another World Series for eight, 86 years. When Babe joined the Yankees, they had never played in the World Series. They were counting on Babe to make it happen, and they wanted him to hit not pitch. That suited him fine. However, things didn't start off well with his new team. He struck out three times in one game and then hurt his ribs swinging his bat to hurt. For weeks, he was more of a strikeout king than a home run king. His first homer with the Yankees didn't come until May after his ribs healed. From then on, he hit home run after home run. He made a notch for each run on his favorite bat. Babe was not only good for the Yankees, but he was good for the sport of baseball. Baseball was in trouble because of a terrible scandal. Players on the Chicago White Sox had taken bribes to let the Cincinnati Reds win the 1919 World Series. Ball players had always been heroes to kids and grown ups alike. Fans of that let down and angry. Babe was the right man to res restore fans' of faith in baseball. Huge crowds turned out to watch his powerful slacks. By hitting homers, Babe changed the focus of the game. It no longer depended so much on pitching skill. Now, batting power won games. Fans liked seeing more action and higher scores. They loved Babe's cocky energy. When he swung his bat, he did it with all his might. If he missed, the follow-through would send him twirling around. It looked a little silly, but Babe didn't care, because when he did hit the ball, wazer, it really flew. Since there was no TV, yet people listened to games on the radio. Sports, sportscasters described what was happening play by play. They got really excited whenever Babe hit a long run. So did newspaper reporters. They tried to tap one another in thinking of nicknames for him like, a, like the Sultan of Swa, the King of Crash, the Prince of Pounders, and the Coloss Colossus of Cloud. It was Babe O'Mania. On July 19, Babe belted out his 13th home runs to smash his own record, and he didn't stop there. By season's end, he'd hit 54 home runs. The National League leader had only hit 15. The Red Sox finished the season in fifth place. They would not win a Red World Series again until 2004. Many friends thought this was because they'd lost Babe. The Italian word for Babe is... Bambino. The Red Sox's unlucky streak came to be known as the cause of the Bambino. Babe didn't look like most other players of his day. They were slender and fast. He was tall and looked top heavy with broad shoulders, muscular arms, and a big body atop skinny legs and small feet. He could really eat. Once, he ate several bags of 
peanuts, ate hot dogs and apple, and drank five sodas. Afterward, he got a stomachache. Joking, he blamed it on the apple. He ate big all the time and bobbed when he felt like it, not caring who hurt. Naturally, he gained weight over the years. News reporters liked him because he was so entertaining. They always had something to write about. During a 1928 World Series game against the Cardinals, St. Louis fans booed him after a call they didn't like. Back then, fans would throw lemons, eggs, cabbages, hats, and even umbrellas on the field when they weren't mad. This time, someone threw a soda bottle. Baby picked it up and made a silly show of pretending to throw it back. Fans stacked, but Baby just laughed and tossed the bottle away. The fans laughed with him. The booming ended. Most players liked being around Babe. He was funny, honest, and didn't hide his feelings. He was the life of the party, always full of energy. Practical jokes were great fun for him. He would cut the tools of other players' socks or nail their shoes to the floor. Babe was very competitive and desperately wanted to win any game he played, whether it was baseball, shuffleboard, golf, bowling, or cards. But he also encouraged other players and gave them tips to improve. One player Babe didn't always get to get along with was Ty Cobb of the Detroit Tigers. Cobb liked the slowest style of play that had been popular before break. Like many ball players back then, Cobb teased the players of the other teams. He'd call them names, hoping to make them lose their focus. But when Ty Cobb teased the babe, it hurt his feelings and made him mad. Games were always during the day. Night games didn't start until stadium got electric lightning, lighting steering in 1935. So babe was free to go to restaurants and parties and have a good time every night. His steering sally was the Yankees worth $20,000. Double what he'd made with the Red Sox. There were plenty of people around to help him spend his cash and get into trouble. From 1920 to 1933, it was against the law to sell alcohol in the United States. Even so, a famous rich man like Bev could buy booting illegal whiskey. He spent many nights gambling, getting drunk, eating, smoking, and joking around with his friends. He was gone so much that his roommate on tour told a reporter he didn't share a room with Babe. He shared it with Babe's suitcase. Babe still made it to his games each day, but often he was tired and not playing his best. He had a daughter named Dorothy in 1921, but being a father didn't slow him down. Sometimes he acted like a big kid himself. He crashed or caused, caused and could be rude. He was also kind, hearted and almost always smiling. Kids everywhere loved him, and he loved them. He could be himself around them. He didn't have to watch his manners, and they wouldn't try to boss him around. Whenever he could, he visited children in orphanage and hospitals. Babe never forgot St. Mary's. He donated money to the school and paid for the students to come to his games. When part of St. Mary's burned down in a fire, he took the school band, band on the road with the Yankees. The band played before 
each game. Afterward, they collected money from the crowd to help rebuild this their school. On visits to St. Mary's, Babe would fill his pockets with coins. He'd toss handfuls in the air for the boys to chase. Then he would put on a show for them, just as Brother Matthias had once done. With a swing of his bat, he'd send balls soaring over the boys' heads. They would rush to catch fried balls, which hit by the famous Babe Ruth. Chapter 8 Superstar When the 1921 season started, fans were buzzing. Could Babe match his 54 home run record of the year before? Many said it was impossible. People took bets on that. Babe was right where he wanted to be. The center of attention, a star. For him, there was nothing more thrilling than slashing a ball out of sight and scoring a home run. He would circle the bases and tip his cap to his fans as they went wide to cheering. Other players studied him closely. They watched the way he stood at the plate and how he swung, trying to figure out the baby's secret. His balance and timing were excellent. He once said that he thought his batting ability was a gift, like a musical talent. One thing was for sure, he made hitting home runs look easy. Pitchers were afraid of him. They tried to fall him out with poor throws, because if he caught the ball with his bat, watch out. By the end of the season, he'd proven himself again. He'd beaten his record with an astounding 59 home runs. The other league's best was less than half that at only 23. He was the home run king. The Yankees came up against the New York Giants in the 1921 World Series. It will be the best of five out of nine games. Going in, the Giants were a strong all-around team. The Yankees depended heavily on De Babe, but the Giants pitcher threw outside the curve balls. Babe was having trouble hitting them. In Game 2, Babe slid into third base, avoiding the tag. He scrapped his arm. He scrapped it again in the next game. It got badly infected. In Game 5, he hurt his knee. By now, he felt dizzy and sick, except for one pitch he hit. He had to sit out the rest of the World Series. The Yankees lost. In 1921 offseason, Babe decided to go barnstorming. Barnstorming meant playing games with teams that were not in the majors. Babe never liked the rules and ignored the fact that Burnstorming was illegal for World Series players. He made lots of extra money, but got suspended for the first six weeks of the 1922 season. He spent the weeks of weeks of overeating and drinking for fun. He joined the Baudeville Act, signing, singing, and telling jokes. And he went into the hospital to have his tonsils removed. By the time he was allowed to rejoin the team, he was out of shape and cranky. In May, he threw dot in the uh, umpire's eye and uh, chased the uh, heckler in the stand. In June, he argued with an umpire and was suspended for five games, but he was still the star everyone came to see. In August, the biggest baseball crowd ever came to Michigan's Nothing fell. The Yankees were playing the Detroit Tigers. People with their chickens climbed telegraph poles and trees near the stadium so they could watch the game. It was Yankees win, 11-6. Somehow, Babe still managed to hit 35 home runs that year even though he had missed a third of the season. Three other players had hit more. 
but he struck in the World Series, making only two hits. The Giants won again. Afterward, the mayor of New York, as well as his Yankee, Yankee teammates, told Babe he'd let them down. He was ashamed of himself, he promised. To do better next season. First, Babe had to get in shape. During the offseason, he and Helen bought an eight acre farm named Home Plate in San Sad Bell in Massachusetts. The house had 12 rooms and cost a whopping 12,000 dollars at the farm. He kept the cattle, pigs, horses, chicken, and dog named Dixie. It was dream come true for a boy who'd grown up poor. He cut back on his eating and quit drinking. For exercise, he chopped the wood, ice skated, hiked, and walked with his animals. His daughter, Dorothy, was delighted to have him home. She adored him. He was so much fun, always laughing and joking around. But when 1923 season rolled around, he left again. She really missed her death. Babe began the season in tip-top form. form. It was an exciting time for the Yankees. Their new home, Yankee Stadium, had just been built. It could hold 70,000 people. Would fans forgive Babe and fill the seats to watch him? On opening day, the stands were packed with a reported crowd of 74,200. When Babe came to bed, a pitch sailed over home plate. He slugged it. Boom! It was a terrific slam toward the right field. Fans leapt to their feet to watch it go and go. Eventually, it landed in the stands. Everyone cheered like crazy. Babe Ruth had just hit the first home run ever in Yankee Stadium. After the Yankees beat the Red Sox that day, a sports writer dubbed dab, dab, dab the stadium the, ho- the house that Ruth built. It was a nickname that struck. The season was a great one. Great one for Babe and his team. The World Series came down to two rival New York teams, the Yankees and the Giants, for the third year in a row. The past two years, the Giants had won. Not this year. Babe was on fire. Instead of letting him hit, the Giants walked to him when they could. But Babe still homered in games 4 and 5, and the Yankees took the series. Babe was voted most valuable player in the American League by the end of 1923. He was the biggest superstar in ever. Chapter 9 Babe Era- Erific No matter how famous he got, Babe remained a down to earth guy. During the hot summer months, he would buy a cabbage on his way to a game and keep it keep it in a bag of ice. He'd pull up a leaf up and out and then tra- tuck it under his cap to keep cool. He wasn't impressed by anyone, not by other players, not by president or royalty. When he met US President Calvin Coolidge, he called him Prats. And when he met Queen Wilhelmania of the Netherlands, he said, Here, Queenie, he called the most people Kit because he had trouble remembering names. In 1924, Baby had a good year, but 1925 was horrible. Once again, he was back to his bad habits. He ate and drank too much and didn't exercise. By the beginning of the season, he had gained 50 pot and had a pot berry. He broke the team rules by staying out late one night 
and got suspended and fined. During the season, he failed and wound up in the hospital for six weeks. It was no wonder that two other players had more formers than he did that year. He and his wife Helen separated in August. Everything seemed to be falling apart. Babe knew things had to change. He apologized to his team and then to his fans in a magazine article. During the off season, he began working out at the gym. Soon he was a force of the team again. He set another record in 1926 by doing something that seemed almost impossible. During the World Series, he promised an injured boy in the local hospital that he'd hit the home run for him. He tripled that promise, hitting a record three series home runs, and he wasn't done making his three yet. Julian, 1927, he was the first player to hit 60 home runs in one season. He reached 54 homers the following year, but would never break his own record. When Roger Maris of the Yankees finally did 34 years later, many Babe Ruth fans were so broken hearted that they booed. Fans didn't just like Babe, they loved him. His first year playing baseball, he'd gotten only one fan letter, and then, and that one was former brother. Matthias, in 1927, he got 20,000 letters from France. Sometimes strangers made the checks to him. If he signed and cashed the check, the bank would return it to the firm afterward. Instant autograph. Babe signed so many autographs in his lifetime that his signature isn't worth as much as some other players. Yankees became the first team to give players a parliament, parliament, par, par, permanent numbers in 1929. Babe was third in the batting order, so he had the number three. His team teammate, Lou Garhit, was fourth in the other order and got number four. Lou was a great player, but he was often Overshadowed by Babe, the two of them were very different. Low was calm and quiet, still, Low and Babe became good friends. By now, Helen and Babe had been apart for almost four years. Babe had fallen in love with a woman named Clary Hodgson. After Helen died in 1929, he married Claire. Babe Dorothy Clare and Clare's daughter Julia all went to live in a luxury, luxurious New York apartment. Clare was no nonsense wife. She tried to get back to eat right and get enough sleep. Like a mischievous cat, he found ways around her rules. In 1930, the Yankees gave Babe a rise to eight. $80,000. This is especially amazing because it came at the beginning of the Great Depression. Although many people were losing their jobs, baseball was king and Babe was a national hero. He made good things seem possible. If a poor kid like Babe could grow up to be rich and famous, it gave everyone hope. Chapter 10 Slowing Town In 1931, two Yankees, Babe and Lou Garrick, tied for the most home runs at 46 each. It was the last time Babe was a league home run leader. Times had changed. Plenty of other players were knocking out 30 or more homers a season. Jimmy Fox, the Philadelphia Athletics, hit 58 home runs in 1932. Only two short of tying Babe's record. Babe was slowing down, but he wasn't finished making baseball history yet. One of his most famous homers ever came in the 1932 World Series. It was Babe 
and the Yankees against the Chicago Cubs at Wrigley Field. When Babe missed the catch playing right field, Cubs fans laughed and wooed. He was embarrassed. Next time he got up to bat, he decided to show them. The first pitch came. It was perfect, but Babe let it pass on purpose. Grinning, he held up one finger toward the Cubs' stance. Counting strike one, two more pitches came, both called the balls. Then another perfect pitch. Babe let it pass again without swinging. He held up two fingers toward the Cubs' fans. Counting strike two, they were going wild. They could hardly wait to see him strike out. What happened next is a sports legend. Babe made a gesture toward the center field with one arm. Was he teasing the pitcher or was he calling his shot, plan planning to send the ball in the direction he was pointing? A third perfect pitch came his way. This time he found Paul. The ball sailed toward the center field and into the stands. A home run. He laughed his way around the bases. Yankees fans were thrilled that the Cavs were quiet now. Quiet now. Soon the news was everywhere that he'd called his shot. To this day, no one is sure still this was his last series and he had played it in a big way. He went on to rack up 34 home runs in 1933 and 22 in 1934. For a baseball player, he was getting old, almost 40. In 1934, he went on tour in Tokyo, playing for Satellite Cross. Baseball crazy Japan loved him. Back in the US, the Yankees knew Babe was nearing retirement. They traded him to Boston Bravers in 1935. He was no longer the same powerhouse, but he still had star power. On May 25, he smashed out three home runs against the Pittsburgh Pirates. The final homer was the first ever to fly outside the ballpark. The crowd roared as Babe rounded the bases. This was the last home run of his career, number 714. No one else had hit even half that today. Eight days later, Babe retired from baseball. He dreamed of becoming a team manager, but team owners were afraid to give him the job. Babe had broken too many rules too many times. He kept hoping they'd change their minds. They didn't. On June 13, 1948, Babe helped to celebrate the 25th anniversary of Yankee Stadium. He was determined to be there even though he was sick with throat cancer. When he walked to home plate, the crowd cheered. They still adored him. He spent his last days in the hospital, signing, signing autographs and watching baseball on television. He got hundreds of letters from friends, kids gathered outside, bringing him flowers and pen pennies. President Henry Truman called the to wish him well, and the mayor of New York came to visit. He died on August 16, 1948, at age 53. The flag at Yankee Stadium flew at half mast. Later, the Yankees retired his number. No other player on the team will ever wear the number three. On the day he died, Babe held 54 major league records. He had hit a total of 714 home runs in 22 seasons. One out of every four balls he hit in the majors had been a former. His record would not be broken until 1974 by Hank Aaron of the Atlanta Braves. Today, he still ranks number three for the most all-time home runs. Only Hank Aaron, 755, and Barry Bonds, 
762 have hit more. Bat was more than a baseball player. He was a legend. He was a hero during tough times when America needed heroes. His big heart and talent changed baseball forever. There will never be another Babe Ruth.